ID and at the State Department. For the last 10 years, I've been at National Defense University, so within the Department of Defense. Um, the national security enterprise is conservative and sometimes can be resistant to change. The institutions are big. Uh, the platforms are capital intensive, very complicated, and uh, it's difficult to change people's perceptions of what the major threats are. I'm sure you're familiar with Chairman Dunford's formula, four plus one. That is his assessment of the threats to the national, US national security, four plus one being China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, plus violent extremism. The issue that I often have in the national security enterprise is persuading them that what we're here to talk about today is really an existential national security threat. As General Mattis used to say to me when he was still just General Mattis, uh, Michael, if you want us to pay attention to X, what is it you don't want us to pay attention to? What do we take out of the national threat assessment? Uh, so it has been difficult to get people's attention within the Pentagon and the national security enterprise on this issue. They often say, um, so what is new about all the stuff that you're talking about? And in fact, there are biblical references to terrorism, to trafficking, to smuggling, all the kind to kleptocracy. This is not a new phenomenon. But I would argue that there have been technical and scientific changes, developments that have caused a confluence of highly uh, what you might call disruptive discontinuities that in fact are ushering in a new paradigm for assessing the national security threat. Goods and services moving around the world at an ever greater uh, level. There are as many as 20 million intermodal container units in the world, 15 million of which are on the high seas at any one time, 10 million of which come into the United States in any given year, 2% of which are inspected by border authorities. Uh, this is unprecedented. Cash is on the move all around the world. Up to $30 billion a day, primarily through financial electronic means, many uh, very difficult to monitor or detect. People are on the move. Louise mentioned that there are 65 million displaced people. There are 1 billion arrivals around the world. That's fully 20% of humanity moving internationally every year. A sea of humanity, very easy to miss any particular individual you might be looking for. And data is on the move. Uh, Seven billion mobile telephones today, that's more than there are people. Two billion computers. Every second, this, the amount of data that moves around the world every second equals the full content of the US Library of Congress. That's 45% more than uh, just 10 years ago. In 1997, Stephen Stedman created this typology of illicit uh, spoiler groups, which he divided them amongst greedy spoilers, absolute spoilers, and limited spoilers. This is a pretty, I think, still relevant uh, typology, but the illusion that it leads to is that a group is either one or the other. It is either a, a limited spoiler or a greedy spoiler. It's analytically useful because all of our an analysis is meant to abstract from reality, but the reality is, or at least it seems to me that the evidence is compelling, that none of these groups are unidimensional anymore that over the last 30 years, at least, if not from time immemorial, at, there have been at least two significant developments. One is an unprecedented level of interaction between international terrorists, between transnational criminal organizations, and networked insurgencies. And these transactions could be characterized as collusion, collaboration, cooperation, uh, whatever you want, but it is unprecedented. And granted, as General Kelly used to say uh, when he was General Kelly, uh, we don't have intercepts between Hezbollah and the Sinaloa cartel that say we're working together. These are not necessarily mergered, uh, uh, mergers. We don't know the exact nature of these uh, interactions, but we do have evidence that they are interacting, that these groups are interacting at an unprecedented rate. The other development is the what I call the hybridization of organizations. Uh, take Hezbollah, once considered just a terrorist organization, but what else is Hezbollah? 
It's also one of the world's largest criminal enterprises. Hezbollah used to reap $60 million a month from a cigarette smuggling operation between North Carolina and Michigan. Uh, it's a criminal organization, one of the major drug traffickers. Look at ISIS, trafficking in antiquities, people, drugs. The same could be said, hybridization could be said of Sinaloa Cartel or any of the other major transnational criminal organizations. They have taken on the operational modalities of terrorist organizations, the propaganda of the deed. Just recall the five heads, uh, severed heads that were rolled onto the dance floor in uh, Mexico uh, 10 years ago. How is that different from terrorism? So we see the hybridization of organizations and we see, uh, we see the uh, unprecedented level of interaction between organizations. Um, I have a whole list of examples of illicit uh, net threat networks operating together, but I won't go through the whole list. Uh, let me just say that some of us have called this convergence. It's a term that is not meant to create controversy. Uh, it could mean any number of things. It could be the convergence of organizations, as in Zawahiri's co organization converti converging with uh, Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda back in the 1990s. It could also be the convergence of modalities, organizations that do, are operating, operating in multiple modes, both terroristic modes and criminal modes. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the work of a uh, esteemed colleague of mine, Scott Helfstein, who used to be at the Combating Terrorism Center at, um, at West Point, in trying to determine whether or not convergence was for real he took a group of 40 smugglers, known designated smugglers, and uh, he applied them to the Thomson Reuters data bank, which uh, has, is, I think, several, 12,000 or so sources, many millions of data points. And he did a single degree of separation, network node analysis, and he found that those 40 smugglers were connected by one degree of separation to 754 terrorists, transnational criminals, and insurgents. A second degree of network analysis revealed that those uh, 754 were, by one degree of separation, related to 2,739 uh, individual nodes, 98% of which were connected in a single network. That is to say, one degree or two degrees of separation. So we used to say six degrees of separation. Now I think we can be pretty clear that anybody in these networks can communicate with anyone else in these networks. They're just a click away. Um, as we know, uh, ISIS was a, uh, is an international uh, phenomenon with recruits coming from as many as 88 countries. Um, so what I would propose, and, and this is the subject of some books that we published at National Defense University, is that what this is creating is a pervasive alternative political reality that's parasitic. It's a political economy that is parasitical to our own Westphalian system. It's not small. 20 years ago, Michel de Candesou estimated that the total volume of the global illicit economy was 2 to 5% of global product. Uh, at that time, global product was $60 trillion. I seriously doubt that the percentage of the global economy that is illicit is less today than it was 20 years ago, because I can't think of a single illicit market that is shrinking. Uh, today, the global economy is $100 trillion, roughly. That would be, if it's still 5%, that's $20 trillion. That's the size of the political economy, what I call the alternative parasitic political economy. $20 trillion is also, by the way, the size of the US economy. So we're not talking about small fish. And this money is in the hands of terrorists, transnational criminals, and networked insurgents. Um, it's, also, uh, it's also complicated by the introduction to the global economy of what Moises Nayin calls mafia states, what he and I have called criminal states, what Douglas Farah calls criminalized states. States that use the traditional tools of statecraft. Okay, I got the message. Um, so uh, the challenge that this presents is to me a challenge to the Westphalian system. 
Our challenge, my challenge, is to persuade policymakers that not every existential threat to our national security comes in the shape of airliners crashing into uh, skyscrapers or mushroom clouds, that this is every bit as existential a threat as some of the others that uh, General Dunford has uh, posited, and that in fact, just like cancer is an existential threat, every bit as existential as a bullet to an individual, this is an insidious, slow-moving existential threat, which if we do not face, could signal, uh, I would say, a very grave present danger to the global order that we know today. I will uh, conclude by just saying that I would invert General Dunford's order, and I would say that the, my threat assessment is one plus four. This is much more insidious and uh, existentially threatening over the long term. With that, I'll close and um, pass the floor to the, the next speaker.